When most people think of algorithms, they think of, well, this. But in reality, it's a lot more approachable than random expressions just flying around on the screen. Algorithms are really important because they determine the speed at which you're finding a solution to your problem. But the biggest vice with algorithms is choosing the right one. The time complexity is super important because it represents the max number of computations that you can make for a single solution. Now, with that being said, let's jump into some popular algorithms. A linear search is pretty self-explanatory. We're basically just counting through every object in an array or an array list. We start at the zeroth index and then we iterate until we find our element or until we get to the end of the list. It's kind of like a salesperson walking from door to door. They'll hit house number zero first and then house number one and then house number two until someone decides to finally buy their product. The max amount of time it'll take to find your element is the length of the list, O of N. Okay, so let's take a look at a coding example. So we've created an array right here. We've initialized the array with some numbers. Now we actually have a for each loop here. We're going to loop through every single element in the array. And if the number that we iterate to is eight, then we can go ahead and print out that number. We've also gone ahead and just printed out every number that we pass as well. And then we'll break out of the loop here. So when we run this, it looks like you can see that we've iterated through four, seven, one, nine. And then finally we land on eight, which here you can see we don't have to go to the rest of the elements on the list because we've already found our number. Okay, so moving on to binary search. Imagine you live in a 100 story building and you wanna find the closest floor at which you can drop an egg and the egg won't break. So you look in your fridge and you grab some eggs. How are we gonna actually find the solution? Well, you could start at the first floor and then drop the egg and then go to the second and then the third floors. But it's gonna take a long time to find the floor at which the egg won't break. Instead of that, let's try to cut our options in half every single time. We can start at the 50th floor and then if the egg breaks, we know that it's between the 0th and the 50th floor. So we cut that in half and go to the 25th floor and we keep repeating that process until we find our target. This is called binary search and we usually find things within log n time. So here you can see that we actually have an array and we've initialized it with a bunch of numbers. Now we have a target number seven and we're gonna go and do a binary search on this array to find our target number. So here's our binary search method. We have a low that's been initialized to zero, a high that's been initialized to the length of the array. And now we'll have a while loop so while our low is less than or equal to our high we'll continue going into this while loop we're going to have a mid number that's set to our low plus the high minus the low divided by two so right here that's going to find the mid number within our high and low at that time and then we're going to do a bunch of checks so if our array at mid is equal to our target that means we've found our value so we can go ahead and return that mid which is the index at which the value is otherwise if it's less than our target that means we can go ahead and set our low equal to the middle of our low and high. Otherwise, we can set our high equal to our mid because we're shifting our data set based on if the target is lower or higher than our mid at that time. And then we'll continue going on throughout that loop. So let's go ahead and run this while we're looking for the target seven. So it looks like we found our element at index three. So you can see here, this is at index three. Two pointers just means using two pointers to point at different indexes on an array. One example is adding numbers in a sorted list. Let's say you have a list that goes in ascending order. You wanna find the two numbers that add up to nine. We'll have two pointers, one at the zeroth index and one at the last index. We add both numbers together. And if they're bigger than the target, then we decrement the pointer to the right. If the target is bigger than the sum, then we actually increment the left one until we find the two numbers that actually work together. This solution takes linear time. So here again, we actually have an array that we've initialized and we have a target number of nine. So this time we're trying to find two numbers that add up to the number nine. And this list is in ascending order. So we're gonna have a pointer that starts at one and a pointer that starts at 14. And we're gonna decrement or increment each pointer depending on if we're larger or smaller than our target. So here is the find two numbers function. So we have our array of nums and we have our target. So what we're gonna do first is while our left pointer is less than our right and we've set our left equal to zero, so the zeroth index and we've set right equal to the length of the array. So we have our left at the zeroth index and our right at the end of the array. We're gonna set our sum equal to the addition of those two values. So whatever's at the zeroth element and whatever's at the last element. Now, if our sum is equal to our target, we can go ahead and return those two values because we found our target. But if the sum is less than our target, we're gonna increment the left pointer. So we wanna add more numbers. But if our sum is less than our target, that means we've gone too big. So we wanna decrement the right pointer and get a 
smaller number on the right, and we'll keep incrementing the left or decrementing the right until either the two pointers overlap or until we find our number. And let's go ahead and run this. So the two numbers are two and seven. And as you can see, we have a two here and a seven here. So those are the two numbers that'll add up to nine. Now, if you thought that was difficult to code, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have a solid grasp of software engineering fundamentals before you master these algorithms. And Zero to Mastery has the perfect platform to do just that. Not only does Zero to Mastery offer updated courses on learning, Python, React, or Java, but they also recognize that people need more focus when learning a new skill. For that reason, they've actually introduced a career path section. If you're not sure which courses to take, just start by taking their career paths quiz. This quiz will ask you about your years of experience, what you want to get out of the program, and it'll actually build a custom list of courses just for you. And you'll also have access to a Discord community of 400,000 plus people where you can ask questions and connect with other ZTM students. There's even a channel where you can find an accountability buddy and make sure that you're actually following through with the lessons. The best part of all is being able to track major milestones using the ZTM passport. You'll even receive course completion certificates that you can add to your LinkedIn profiles and resumes. And what about extra project? They just released a new projects tab where a new project will be released every week for this entire summer. This will give you plenty of options when choosing projects to add to your resume. I've honestly been blown away by the quality of these courses and I don't want you guys to miss out. Look at that. The UI is so amazing. I feel like I've had issues in the past with a lot of these platforms not really looking that great and it's hard to navigate them, but this is honestly the best. I'm excited for you guys to try it out for real. I've provided some links to popular courses in the description below, including their career quiz. So what are you waiting for? Go check it out. Okay, let's get back to the video. Recursion is just a function calling itself over and over again until a base case is reached. Think about it. We can have a function get salary called get position, which calls get years of experience. Get salary gets pushed onto the stack and then get position and finally get years of experience. Then the last function will execute and return that result to the function that called it all the way back up to the top of the stack. Same thing with recursion, except it'll keep calling itself until the last function call executes from start to finish. And then it'll start popping function calls off of the stack again. Confused yet? Well, let's look at a coding example. So here we have our main method and we have a number that's equal to 10. And then we're gonna set our result equal to some number. So sum is actually our recursive function. So you can see here that we have our number. If our number is equal to one, we just end up returning one. Otherwise, we're gonna take our number and we're gonna add it to the function call of sum num minus one. So what's happening is we're actually adding all the numbers between one and 10 because 10 is the number that we're passing here. So if we pass in a number five, for example, then we're just gonna be adding up the numbers between one and five. So with one through five, we're actually gonna get an answer of 15. So let's go ahead and run this. And you can see that the sum of the numbers from one to five is 15. So what's happening is the first pass, we have a five and then we're adding sum four because num minus one, which is five minus one is four. So we're adding five plus the sum of four. And then the sum of four is four plus the sum of three. The sum of three is three plus the sum of two and so on. And then finally, we get to the point where num is equal to one. So we'll return one and we'll pop that function call off of the stack. So a little bit confusing sometimes, but you can go ahead and use this code to see how it works. Depth First Search allows you to traverse through a data structure by following one path at a time and going to the lowest child in the subtree. You can mark nodes as visited as you traverse through the data structure. You can also use this with 2D arrays, but let's focus on trees for now. And there are three different types of DFS with trees. We have in order, post order, and pre order. So let's take a look at what those are. So with in order, we're actually going to first go to the left nodes and then we'll visit the node and then we'll go to the right. So here we'll start at this node and then we'll go left and then we'll go left and there's nowhere else to go so we'll go ahead and visit that node and print out three and then we kind of backtrack and we go back up to the four and we'll print that out and then we'll go right and we'll print the six out and then we'll backtrack go back up go back up we'll back up to the nine we'll go ahead and print that there's nowhere else to go in terms of left or printing out the nine so we go to the right and then we go to the left and then we print out 11 backtrack print out 12 and then we go to the right again so we're always going left as much as possible and we're visiting the node and then we're kind 
kind of returning back to where we started and then we're going right. So with pre-order, it's the exact opposite where we're first visiting and then we're going to the left node and then we're going to the right. With post-order, we're going to the left, right, and then we're visit. So in these DFS examples, let's look at in order first. So first we're checking if the root is equal to null and if it is, we're returning. Otherwise, we're gonna call in order again with the left child of the root. Then we're gonna go ahead and print the value and then we're gonna call in order again with the right child of the root. So this is pretty simple to code up, but the concept can sometimes be confusing. Now with post order is a different combination, right? So we're first going left, we call post order and we pass in the left root, the left child. Then we call post order and we pass in the right child and then we'll visit or we'll print out the node. So this one is L R V. Now, lastly, with pre order, we're going to print or visit the node before we go left and right. So we're first going to print out the node and then we're going to call pre order and pass in the left child and then call pre order and pass in the right child. Breadth first search allows you to search by level or generation. We search all the nodes on one level and then proceed to the next level. We can use a queue data structure to keep track of nodes on a level as well as recursive calls to continue with the algorithm. We're actually looking at level traversal instead of going really deep into those nodes. So we're gonna first look at this level and then the second level and then the third level. So let's look at a coding example. So with BFS, again, we've defined our tree node and then we actually have our function right here and it's called BFS. So of course we have our base case where we check if the root is equal to null and if it is then we're going to go ahead and return and we're going to actually use a queue to store all of our nodes in that specific generation or in that level as we're traversing. So while our queue is not empty we're going to continue traversing into this algorithm. So we're going to set our node equal to queue.pull which means we're just going to grab whatever's first in the queue and then we're going to go ahead and print out that val. Now if the left child of that node is not equal to null we're going to actually go ahead and add Add that left child to the queue. If our node.right is not equal to null, we're going to also add that right file to the queue. So we're going ahead and assuming that there's only going to be two children, and depending on if they're null or not, we're going to add both children to the list, and then we're going to continue through that while loop and then pop the first child that shows up. And that's how we do that level order traversal. So let's go ahead and run this. So you can see with the BFS traversal, we'll, we'll get a one, two, three, four, five, and this is kind of what our nodes look like. And I'll share the coding examples in the description below as well. Dynamic programming breaks down complex problems into smaller subproblems and stores their solutions to avoid redundant calculation. For example, when finding the nth Fibonacci number, instead of recalculating all previous numbers each time, dynamic programming stores the Fibonacci sequence in a table and uses pre-computed values to find the next part of the sequence. This approach significantly reduces the time and effort required. Let's look at a coding example. So here you can see that we actually have our memo array and that array is going to hold our Fibonacci numbers. So we're doing the Fibonacci sequence again, but this time we're going to actually hold those values that we've previously calculated and then continue adding those previous values that are added to this array. Um, so we're going to go ahead and call this Fibonacci helper. And again, it's going to take in our number. That's going to be our main number that we're starting with. And then we're going to also have our memo, which is just our array of previously calculated values. So if our n is less than or equal to one, we're going to return that number. If our memo at index n is not equal to zero, then we're going to go ahead and return memo at index n. And then we're going to set fib, which is just a long that we've created, equal to our Fibonacci helper. We're going to pass in n minus 1 plus n minus 2, because remember, we're, we're actually adding the two previous numbers, and we're also passing in memo, because if that value exists in memo, then we're going to go ahead and grab that value as well. And then we're going to set our memo at index n equal to our answer. And then we're going to go ahead and return our fib, which is, again, the long that we've set. So every time we call this Fibonacci helper, Helper, we're going to continue to recursively call that function. So let's go ahead and run this function. We're passing in a 10 as our n. So the Fibonacci number at index 10 is 55. Now, there are obviously more algorithms out there, but these are the basic algorithms that you should start learning if you want to do well in your interviews. Many of these are used to solve more difficult DSA problems later on. So having a good foundation is really important when moving to concepts such as memoization, Dijkstra's algorithm, and the traveling salesman problem. I'm sure you guys will do well. Well, good luck.